Hello, my name is Thiago de Carvalho Galo Pereira and I will present my master thesis. First of all, I would like to thank you, Teófilo de Campos, my supervisor, and the examination board composed by Dr. Mikolaiski, Dr. Machiavello, and Dr. Vidal. Uh, my work is entitled Unsupervised Domain Adaptation for Real World Person Reidentification. But uh, let's start defining what is person reidentification. So basically, person identification is an image retrieval task where the object in the images are people. It can be used to do some kind of intelligent surveillance or a multi-camera tracking for people, where you have a group of cameras, a, a group of maybe a CCTV cameras, and the, your CCTV cameras are collecting images from people around multiple cameras that are non-overlapping. So you have a gallery of images of people and given um, an, a new image of people, you want to search for this subject in your gallery. You want to know where it uh, was passing uh, moments earlier. And for this scary image, you want to find the matches for each in your gallery. So basically the person identification is the algorithm that will allow you to do this matching and with that you can use for a lot of real-world applications. Uh, the motivation for, is, for our work is that uh, regardless of the scenario or the application or the person identification the goal will always be to match person images from different overlap cameras. But when you add a new camera for your system, or you change uh, change a camera, or even you get your algorithm, your model, and want to apply a new CCTV system, these new viewpoints, this the new appearance of people, maybe your model was prepared to see people in a front or back view, and now you put your camera in a position where you are seeing people from side views, it will have a huge impact in your model performance and it can be a really roadblock for real world applications. So we want to have a way to adapt our model or to retrain our model in these new cameras, in this new scenario, without the need of human annotation and human your work. So you can deploy uh, this method in a real world scenario. So this is our motivation. Uh, to achieve that, we set three auxiliary goals as our objectives. So first, we start implementing a baseline to understand how domain adaptation works for passenger identification, what we could do and have something to start on. Then we identified some flaws in our baseline and proposed some techniques to undermine them. Finally, we improve our proposed methods and compare them with the state of art algorithms to see if if we achieve it, our final goal that was propose something in the state of the art. Uh, during the course of this work, we have some contributions with three publications. The first uh, awarded the best student paper at VISAP 2020, and we extended this paper and this work for, uh, for the IG Prey in 2021. That's a, a journal. And finally, earlier this year, we published our newer and best method at VISAP 2022. Uh, so starting a little bit with the background, we are going to use a deep learning approach here for the person identification. And for that, we need a model architecture. Uh, and there are some things that are very important for when we choose the model architecture for person identification and these are we need a model architecture that can encode the person information into a feature vector this feature vector is what we we will use to compare two images from a uh, two images and know if, if they are from the same people or not so in, in, in the final we are comparing the vectors that we extract from the image uh, we want that our uh, neural network be being able to take advantage from different from information of multiple semantic levels, because we know that shallower layers will have more um, like concrete information. It, like the, uh, the shallower layers of our network will see some edges and uh, shapes, and more deeper layers will have more abstract. 
information from the image so maybe in shallower layers we will know like color of the hair and in deeper layers we can know if it was using a backpack or something like that so taking advantage from these multiple semantic levels will be very helpful for our, our task also we want to disregard background information because uh, we don't want to look to the background just for the person in the image and we started with the ResNet 50 our work and then we changed to the IBM Net 50A because it's important for us to be robust against variations in illumination, angle, saturation be, uh, to, to be able to adapt it for these new camera viewpoints and the, the difference between the IBM Net and the res classical ResNet is that instance normalization block here and that instance normalization helps a lot to our network to become robust against these variations so that's why we upgraded the ResNet for the IBM Net in further steps so we also did some experiments with the aligned VID++ because uh, we can think that when we are comparing two images from two, pe two persons it's interesting to compare head to head and like the chest to chest and the lower body to lower body and things like that and here in the aligned VID++ uh, you extract the features with your ResNet 50 backbone uh, then you can get this uh, uh, range here, in here, uh, where you do a global pooling and you have the distance from the features of two images. And this here is the classical approach that we are using. But they also propose to do a horizontal pooling and divide the Im the this final feature map in different horizontal tiles and each horizontal style will produce a local feature and they use their DMLY algorithm to compare the local features from two images in a way they can like align the two images so here we have an example of the DMLY algorithm they divided each feature map into horizontal tiles and they compare all the local features of from one image to the another and they have the distance matrix and in the final what they want is to know what's the uh, minimal distance from the zero zero that's the first to first tile to the hh here that's the final tile to the final tile here and they can calculate an aligned distance and as they are like dy dynamically aligning those, those two images they can have ro uh, more robust uh, results so we also ha did some experiments with this model uh, here we have uh, the idea of magic learning and classification learning uh, as the person ID is an open set challenge because you want to know how to encode person information regardless for from who the person is we can't uh, like do a training saying uh, this is person one person two person three because the people that will appear in our test set uh, are different from the training set the the training and test sets are disjoint so we go for a metric learning approach where we are looking to cluster these features in our output vector space and given a new person we will have features from image from this new person and if they are near in, the, in our output vector space we can say that they are the same person or not uh, but also the classification learning uh, help us to uh, have a good distribution of the features in our output vector space so in further steps we will also use some classification learning uh, methods to help us to produce a better output vector space uh, even though we are working with a magic learning approach and the triplet loss is the loss responsible for producing this output vector that belongs to an Euclidean vector space and uh, a problem with the triplet loss is how to choose the triplets because when we have some data sets with thousands of images we can have uh, a lot of possible triplets and Hermann's et al 
proposed uh, the batch hard approach where f when we are going to choose a triplet you are always working with the hardest case so we want uh, the positive uh, anchor the sorry you have an anchor and the positive feature you want the one that's the furthest from your anchor and the negative feature you want the one uh, which is closer to our anchor so always working with the worst case scenario help us to achieve the best results uh, so a little bit about the data sets we use it we started with viper that's uh, the oldest data set we use it with only uh, 1200 samples from 600 identities on two images for each person and it has an outdoor scenario. Uh, we also have the CUHK03 data set which is bigger and more um, uh, better to train deep neural networks because it has more images and more examples for each person and it is the only data set that we have that was captured at an indoor scene. Uh, then we have the Market 1501 that's a very interesting data set. It's the first data set that we have that uh, have examples of people in more than two cameras and it was shot in an outdoor scene with more than 30,000 images. Then we have the Duke MTMC dataset that's very similar to the market one. It also has an outdoor scene. It also has examples of person from more than two cameras and more than 30,000 samples. Uh, so here we have an overview of all the data sets that we use it we can see that Viper really have uh, a lot less images than the others and the others are better to train deep neural networks. So let's start with our first method. This method is our baseline and here we are we will show a framework that we use it to uh, achieve our, our first two goals. So we started with the ResNet 50, we saw uh, its problems with generalization and we proposed to use the Aligned VID++ to undermine it. So our two goals are here. Uh, so in, in this first approach we use uh, this both model architectures with the triplet loss batch hard and the other optimizer and we also proposed a batch shadow algorithm because as we were working with the batch hard when the batch is too big the universe of comparison is also bigger then you have more hard cases and it could be super hard for the network when it was starting to learn so the idea of our bad scheduler is to uh, ease the process in the start of the training and as the the network is learning we can uh, like increase the complexity of the problem so the our network can be more robust but won't have a, a negative learning problem so we started here training our network in a source domain that could be any one of those three data sets uh, and then we used the cycle again to adapt the image from a source domain to a target domain so the idea here is get an, a lot of images from a source domain and a lot of images from a target domain and without needing to like uh, pair those images, we can uh, adapt the image from the source domain to look like the image from target domain. And doing that, we can generate an intermediate data set that will leverage from the labels from source domain and that will have an appearance similar to the target domain. And we believe that uh, doing a fine tuning for our, from our previous trained network in the source domain in this intermediate in the intermediate domain will help us to have better results in our target domain. So here we have some results for our adaptation in the three data sets that we use at this work. <coughs> and it's very interesting to see that uh, always that we were working with CUHK or Markage as their target domain, in, in the Markage as target we want to like 
put grass in the background of the image because as market was shot in a outdoor scene uh, almost all images of the market have this grass and also in the CUHK as the target domain here uh, we like want to add this granular floor in the background because it was present in almost all images from the CUHK but for Viper, uh, mainly between Viper and Market, we have variations more in the color space, like the saturation of the image. And we will see results that these color space changes produce uh, mm, worse results than the texture trends when we have uh, when we are working with CUHK or Market. Then after we have trained our uh, network in this intermediate domain, we can use pseudo labels. So we'll get all the images from our target domain, extract the features from the null, use your cluster algorithm to uh, group these features, and each cluster will be considered as a person ID. And this way we're, we are creating pseudo labels for the target domain. Then we can fine tune our uh, neural network in this pseudo labels space where we have the actual show image from our target domain but these labels generated by our method so uh, and then we can fine-tune our previous training method in this pseudo labels data set and once we do that we probably will have a neural network that performs better in the uh, target domain then we can apply the pseudo labels again and do this in an iterative way as we apply the pseudo labels, fine tune our model, then we generate new pseudo labels, fine tune the model again, and we can keep repeating this process until full convergence. So here we have some examples of our pseudo labels results uh, with and without using the progressive learning. We can see here that without progressive learning, we have interesting pseudo labels. Uh, here we have uh, a cluster ID, another cluster ID, another cluster ID, and we can see that we can capture some information that uh, makes sense to cluster those images. So here everyone using a yellow shirt here, uh, the color is green and a little bit of blue. Here everybody have a, a black a short or pants and a white or really light uh, shirt but we can see that we have different person IDs in these images and when we use progressive learning and keep repeating this process so we keep refining th those pseudo labels we can achieve better results where we can maybe uh, include more camera views in each uh, cluster and also have a uh, lesser noise like here this guy is not this one but we have stronger similarities like both of them are with shorts and white uh, t-shirts so using progressive learning really help us to refine our pseudo labels and it really helps in the results of our domain adaptation so to the results, our baseline here is using the ResNet50 as the backbone and we can see that the cycle can uh, improve the direct transfer result. Uh, as for direct transfer here is getting the our model trained in the source domain and direct applying it to the target domain. And we can see that the cycle can improve the direct transfer results in almost all cases here it just doesn't improve in market to viper uh, probably what we were talking that market to viper have just some color change and not that texture change when we applied the cycle again and it didn't help a lot but when we use it, the pseudo labels here uh, we could improve the direct transfer and cycle again results for every case uh, and with that we can conclude that uh, using the real image uh, to train the network is the best case scenario because we can really capture all the characteristics of our target domain and achieve the best results. 
So when we change our baseline to the aligned VID++, we improved almost every results. The only one that we didn't improve was Viper to CUHK here. And it's probably because the 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 cycle again here, the intermediate data set wasn't very good and the, the GAN may have some morphological wrong change like someone lose their head or lose an arm and as the aligned VID++ is trying to align these body parts it may may have not dealt deal well with this morphological change with the, the GAN but we can see that using a more robust backbone will improve our results so our framework here uh, can work with different backbones and really take advantage of them. Also here we analyze the results of our batch Shadley algorithm. As the Viper had too little image we didn't use it to analyze the batch Shadley results. So we can see that using Bad Shadler or not, we we have like three cases where the Bad Shadler was better than not using the Bad Shadler. But here the improvement is minimal, so I don't know if can like really uh, say it was a, a good example. And it's kind of inconclusive. Uh, we don't know why here the best shell didn't help. So it probably helps a little bit, but we can have a, a very good conclusion here. Uh, for the cyclogen, we can see that every time that we use it, cyclogen. So here we uh, use it, the cyclogen, and then one step of our pseudo labels, uh, in where we cyclogen with the check mark, and where we didn't use a cyclogen, we got direct from the direct transfer for the first step of pseudo labels. And we can see that having this training in the intermediate data set helps in every case. So the cycle again really helps our final results. Also for the progressive learning here, we have how many iterations of progressive learning we use it. One is just like cycle again, then the first episode labels, and two, three is the iteration process. And we can see that uh, for every case where CHK or MyCurt was as the target domain, we have like a huge improvement using uh, more progressive learning iterations. But for Viper, we didn't have uh, improvement. This happens because Viper have two little images and each person ID in the Viper only have uh, two examples. So our cluster algorithm was always putting uh, images from different people in the same cluster and this was a problem and this was uh, bad for our results. So then we come to our final method where we saw some problems in our uh, uh, other method like our model lacked the, the generalization when we change the domains so we decided to use the IBN net here to be to have a more generalizable backbone also we saw that the pseudo labels can be a little bit noisy and have low quality so we used some techniques here just like the progressive learning to keep refining and keep enhancing the quality of our pseudo labels because it will li really helps we also saw that k the camera characteristics uh, influence a lot in our pseudo labels. Our pseudo labels sometimes tend to group more uh, images by camera than by person ID. So we also work on that. And uh, we saw that the GANs was helping, but it wasn't helping every time and had those morphological problems and the high computational cost. So we we proposed this new framework without using GANs. So the first step is uh, again training our first network in a source domain. Here we use it the same triplet laws with batch hearts that we're using before, but we also use a uh, label smooth cross entropy for the Persian classification because the classification learning here will help us to have a more smoother 
uh, output vector space and we also use the center laws uh, like a regular riser maybe to guarantee more cluster compactness for our model then we have the IBM net 50 with the add optimizer and we use this learning rate schedule for 90 epochs then we analyzed two clustering techniques to create our episode labels uh, the db scan and the k-means the major difference here is that the db scan have a built-in outlier detector so every outlier won't be used in our episode labels and it will help us to produce better episode labels and leave some features that are hard for future steps where we believe that our model will perform better and these features won't be outliers anymore. Uh, we also did a cluster selection here. When we are creating a batch to train our triplet loss, we do the PK sampling strategy where we select K images from P image identities. So we need at least K images for each, per each cluster, each person ID. So if a cluster here do not have like four images, four features, we just don't use the it because it won't be good enough for our batch handler, uh, batch formation uh, algorithm. Also, we want to understand how people look uh, when they change the camera view. So if we have a cluster where all the features are from the same camera, we just remove it because it won't help a lot in our uh, training step. Also, as we said before, sometimes the camera information is guiding the, the clustering more than the person information. So we saw that if we can, if we group all our features by camera and then we ca uh, calculate a camera mean and a camera um, standard deviation. And then for each feature, we normalize it by its camera mean and its camera standard deviation. We have a better alignment for our feature space and can produce better pseudo labels that are more guided from the person information than from the camera information. Then our framework look like that. We start training uh, our model in the source domain. Then we get a lot of unlabeled target domain images, do some feature extraction, then the camera normalization to align this output vector space. Then we do our, our clustering with outlier removal, cluster selection, and episode labels prediction. Then we fine tuning our previous trained model. And this is a cycle because we also use the progressive learning here to, until we reach the full convergence. So here for our baseline results, in, uh, when we trained our model just in the source domain and apply direct in the uh, target domain, so the direct transfer, we have the first line results. We have here in the second line the results that were achieved when training direct in the target domain. And we can see that here the final line is our method using the pseudo labels with progressive learning. And we can see that for Duke, we match the results for the target domain here. And for market, we are very close. And so we propose it to merge source, source and target domains because when we train our method, we start with a pre-trained network in the source domain. Then we use some images from the target domain to adapt our network. So we thought that to be uh, a fair comparison, we should have uh, trained and and model using all the information from the source and target domain include all the images and all the labels and we can see that it enhanced a little bit more the results but our domain adaptation without the labels from target domain uh, still achieve uh, remarkable results here uh, near the, the supervised method 
So comparing with other state-of-the-art algorithms here, we can see that our proposed method uh, pushes the state-of-the-art when we are using the Duke MTMC as the target domain and for the market as the target domain, we are on pair with the state-of-the-art here when we don't use re-ranking and we, when we use the re-ranking as a post-processing uh, step, we can even push the state-of-the-art here so we could really produce a strong method here that is uh, is pushing the state of the art so to understand a little bit more about how each step helped uh, in our results here we started with the ResNet 50 and we can see that just changing the backbone we have a, a clear improvement here then using the domain adaptation that is uh, using the pseudo labels once we can have another push here and when using the progressive learning direct without our cluster selection or camera normalization we can see that the progressive learning don't help a lot because we have like a closed loop here and we are just trying to learn again what we uh, just learned before but when we use the cluster selection and leave the outliers uh, out we can see a, a big improvement here and this this big improvement here is not just the cluster selection but the, the power of this couple this pair using the cluster selection with the progressive learning that's the the real deal here and when we add the camera normalization we can see another uh, excellent improvement here and it really aligning our output vector space helps a lot our pseudo labels and we can achieve these state-of-the-art results so we use it the mark uh, the sorry the dp scan and k means here what we we saw is that the k-means is always using uh, more images from from more samples from the available image to train but it keeps it from having like to a big improvement in the mean average precision results and when we look to the k means here it have a high homogeneity but a lower completeness it's because the k means generates a lot more of clusters than the db scan so with more clusters they have clusters with lesser images and these images are from the same id but is is more probable for the k-means to have two clusters with images from uh, the same person ID and this is probably generating some confusion in the training and some losses in the training process that's guiding the model to, uh, to somewhere we don't want it to go so the database can here with the a uh, high completeness score can give us uh, an excellent result and we can see here that using the outlier detector for the database scan we are uh, like slowly improving uh, how many images we are using and it really helps to have uh, an excellent mean average precision result here when we have the, the Duke MTMC results uh, as the target domain here we have some similar results and the database can uh, really switch better our task than the k-means so here as some final observations our GAN plus pseudo labels method which created a, the baseline for us uh, proved its efficiency and proved that it can work with better and more robust backbones as the aligned VID++ and our mood step pseudo so label refinement method uh, solved some flaws that we identified in our previous method and achieved the state of the art and although our results are very satisfactory we we know that there is still room for improvement in this field of uh, person uh, 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 unsupervised domain adaptation passing re-ID and we believe that these ideas are promising 
we we think that we could like uh, research a little bit more in them like instead of starting our framework training a source domain we could we could use a self-supervised method like a contrastive learning with self-supervision to warm up our initial model directing their target domain image instead of relying in a labeled source domain this, this is very interesting also we saw that better and newer backbones architectures may may, ha may help us a lot so using uh, some newer backbones as the swing transformers or the convex will probably help to achieve even better results uh, that's all thank you